In the Perspectrum podcast, we discuss controversial topics. Outside of this context, Michael and I are both working professionals. While doing the show, we are not acting as agents or representatives of our respective institutions. And none of the views that we express reflect the outlooks of our employers. So don't come to my office and throw toilet paper at me. And I don't have an office, but don't come to my cube. Hello and welcome to another episode of How Fucked Are We? (laughs) Today we have our contestant, Nathan Silo. So Nathan, time to answer this age-old question. How fucked are we? (laughs) Michael, so, 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 so fucked. Yes, we are. Uh, Welcome to the Perspectrum. (laughs) <laughs> we are so fucked. <laughs> um, today we have a uh, an episode that's less fun than this intro, unfortunately. And that <laughs> we're going to be going over the amazing volume of Supreme Court cases that they got wrong uh, at the end of this term and have been releasing over the last couple uh, of last few weeks. Um, so we'll dive into those, talk about them, talk about the implications, all that stuff. And then we want to take a little bit of a step back. You know, we had a sad episode last week. <laughs> yeah, last week's episode was sad in the same way that magma's reasonably hot. <laughs> <laughs> reasonably hot. Yeah, exactly. Like, or in the same way that, you know, Biden, like, you know, was a little hard to understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, he was just, it was just a little spacey. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so the Supreme Court. There's a lot of rulings that are that are bad. It's like, kind of amazing. Amazing. So let's let's start with let's start with one that was good. Mm-hmm. Cause I actually like I, I I do want to number one, give credit where credit's due. Sure. And number two, I don't actually like the fact that that we have been such a doom and gloom podcast oh, for the past totally, several episodes. I totally agree. I we want to be talking about how fun healthcare policy is and yeah. how cool like like these cool progressive solutions can get. Yeah. Like that's what we really want to be talking about. I love doing that. I love doing mm. policy deep dives. I like doing advocacy when it actually feels like there is some hope. So mm. uh there was one court case that came across the Supreme Court's desk about whether or not access to mifepristone uh, would be could be restricted, and unanimously they ruled that it could not. Yeah, kind of, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like uh, mifepristone yeah. is basically a uh, it's an abortion medication that is actually mm-hmm. used in two thirds of all abortions in the United States uh, as of last year, and well, they they ruled that the approval of the federal of of the medication the food and drug administration's medica- medication um could stand basically yeah like that they yeah, that's right. it couldn't be they couldn't be sued over that or over it or that um the people trying to bring suit to uh the food drug administration did not have any like standing, any standing. Yeah, I think, yeah, totally. I totally agree that this is good news. Like, to Nathan's point, two-thirds of abortions use this drug. It's one of two drugs used in medical abortions. Like, it's it's been an avenue for the FDA to kind of relax restrictions, to be able to open up access to easy, safe abortions to people, even in places where they may be uh, restricted and kind of prevented from going to the doctor. You can get this stuff through the mail sometimes, and that can enable someone to access reproductive care, even if they're not uh, in, even if they're in a state where they can't go to their doctor to to receive an abortion. So, and it has been you know ever since Dobbs, it has been the focus to try to you know move beyond yeah. um, uh, you know abortions in person and try to try to fight this this access to mifepristone. And so, yeah, exactly. You got it exactly right, Nathan, with the standing piece. I think this is both, like, it's a good thing. I totally agree, especially given the opinions that we're going to talk about, which basically <laughs> altogether prove pretty conclusively that the court will, at least the conservative majority of the court, will reach any conclusion that they like yeah. if they feel like they want to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, there's no, there was no guarantee here. Uh, but the fact that, you know, they found that the people who brought this case, who um, were a coalition of, of uh, abortion opponents, um, 
didn't have standing because I mean Justice pa- Kavanaugh, who wrote the opinion again, Justice Kavanaugh is a super staunch ultra conservative justice. Um, he said, quote, because the plaintiffs do not prescribe, manufacture, or sell, or advertise mifepristone, or sponsor a competing drug, the plaintiffs suffer no direct monetary injuries from FDA's actions relaxing regulation of mifepristone, nor do they suffer injuries to their property or to the value of their property from the FDA's actions. Because uh, the plaintiffs do not use mifepristone, they obviously can suffer no physical injuries from FDA's actions relaxing regulation of mifepristone. Yeah. So... Exactly. Like, basically, sorry, guys, you can't bring this case because you haven't been injured. And I think at least, like, you know, at least that conclusion is a good one. Yeah. Before we get into the ones that I think are just unambiguously bullshit, there is one that I want to talk to you about for just a little bit. uh, And that is bump stocks. Yeah. So during the Trump administration, Trump basically issued a um, executive order that made it so that the ATF would classify bump stocks as turning a semi-automatic weapon into an automatic weapon. And because of laws from the 30s, uh, an automatic weapon, or you know what, what it referred to back then as like a machine gun, um, mm-hmm. is illegal. Therefore, yeah. because it is being used as an automatic weapon um, to make something an automatic weapon, it violates that law and therefore the uh, the bump stock is banned. Now, just a little refresher. A bump stock is in basically a modification for rifles where it makes it so, like to, to, to put it simply, it makes it so the gun bounces off your shoulder, the stock bounces off your shoulder and pushes the trigger into your finger so that you basically need to just keep your finger in the same place and it'll it'll you know the gun will make it so so you pull it multiple times and yeah. and this is actually the modification that was used during the Las Vegas shooting mm-hmm. where 60 people were killed yeah 60 people were killed a thousand rounds were fired over the course of 11 minutes yeah a bump stock can increase the firing rate of a semi-automatic rifle to 400 to 800 rounds per minute. Yeah, which is similar to like fully automatic rifles like this like you know that are not legal in the United States for civilians. Like you can't yeah. have one. So the Supreme Court took this case and they uh it was it was brought upon by this firearms store owner in Texas who uh, filed suit, and the Supreme Court ruled on party lines, it was a 6-3 decision, that because you are actually pulling the trigger, like the trigger is being pulled, it's not like you pull the trigger and multiple shots come out, that it is technically not an automatic weapon. And therefore, it cannot be classified as an automatic weapon as a means of being banned. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that ruling, Michael? So, um... I think like I think I pretty much align with the dissent in that this ends up being a distinction without a difference in that especially given that this was an ATF ruling. So the whole point I, I think it's interesting that this is a it it's kind of framed as a firearms case, yeah. like a second amendment type case. I actually don't think it is. Yeah. I think it's an actually an administrative agency, administrative law case, more similar to some of the other ones that we'll get into. Yeah. Basically, in this case, the ATF, you know, reached a conclusion that when a modification was made to an otherwise semi-automatic gun, which turns it into something that functions similarly to an automatic gun, then it would fall under a restriction that applies to automatic weapons. Yeah. So, like, as I think about it, it's like the function like like the intent of the law in the past in the 1930s to restrict machine guns was pretty clearly not to restrict a mechanism of firing a gun you know like a machine gun today you pull the trigger right you hold it and the and the same action 
happens many times. Yeah. It just doesn't require that you move your finger every single time. The action that happens many times is that the, you know, the firing pin hits the the charge, it fires, the explosion in the in the uh, chamber of the gun causes a recoil, the recoil power enables the uh shell to be ejected, a new uh, you know, piece of ammunition to be put in place and then the it closes and then that whole mechanism enables the firing pin to hit again like whether your finger is doing the fingering <laughs> like or whether it is a different mechanism because ultimately like ultimately like it seems like the in this case the court came down and said well if it doesn't follow this mechanism this mechanistic implementation of this thing then it doesn't count even if your actions as a shooter are the same yeah and so to me it kind of seems like a pretty like clear restriction on the ability of the atf to be able to say what or to like to be able to um act within what i think is pretty clearly their authority to classify things that behave similarly as similar things yeah um which is like kind of the whole point of having an administrative agency and the whole point of not requiring Congress to amend laws when things in the world change. Yeah. For example, like you could see a world where, you know, maybe Congress writes a law to protect vaccines and it says that an injection with, you know, a inert version of a disease is protected and you can't you can't outlaw it. And it has to be available to U.S. citizens. But then someone comes along and creates an mRNA vaccine. And all of a sudden, people are like, well, you can definitely ban that because it's not the same mechanism. And I'm clearly like they're trying to ban. You're trying to define a vaccine. And an artificially narrow interpretation of that doesn't really serve anybody. That's kind of my that's kind of my perspective. I understand that. I do somewhat disagree. Sure, I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Anybody who's listened to this show before, um, probably knows uh, me as the one. Like, I'm the one who always has terrible takes on guns. Uh, I mean, I think my takes are quite smart. But I'm just sure. I'm 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 just I'm I'm more right wing when it comes to guns. Uh, sure. But here's what I will say: I do want bump stocks to be banned. All right, mm -hmm. I do think they should be banned. And actually, when I first heard about this ruling, yeah, like, um, that's bullshit. Well, yeah, I thought like that's <laughs> bullshit because in my mind I was thinking, yeah, wasn't there like a piece of legislation during the Trump administration that banned it? Like I thought it was a piece of legislation and they ruled that it was unconstitutional because apparently fucking attachment to guns, attachments to guns <laughs> uh, count as like the right to bear arms. And that's Under the and, second amendment. Yeah, <laughs> that and that's, would be clearly bullshit. And that would that would be clearly bullshit. Yeah. But here's here's what I would say about this. You say it's a distinction without a difference. There is a difference. There's a difference in firing rate. I mentioned that, or the the firing rate of a of a of a semi-automatic uh, rifle with a bump stock is 400 to 800 rounds per minute. For an automatic weapon, it's 700 to 950. And of course, you know the reason why there's that why there's a range is because various different rifles have various different firing rates. Like that's sure. just it depends on the rifle that you're using. But the thing is, it does not go as fast as a fully automatic weapon. It does not function exactly like an automatic weapon because you like the the trigger is being pulled. Like there is a clear definition of an automatic weapon. Except you don't have to move your finger. You don't have to move your finger. But the so trigger, the trigger gets is being pulled. pulled by a mechanism that is a component of the firearm. Yeah. But the trigger so but the trigger is still being pulled multiple times it's not you're pulling it once and it's just and it's just firing. you are pulling it once you're moving your finger a single but time. it's not being pulled once is my point it's being pulled by the gun yeah but it's not <laughs> but again, again i think my, i think my, my point is that definitions yeah, matter sure. like when we're talking so 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 you, you 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 know i don't think that this is necessarily a case like i i feel like you you're you were definitely alluding to uh chevron deference which we are going to be talking about Mm -hmm. I don't think that this necessarily applies here because there is a very clear law, like there's an unambiguous law that says fully automatic weapons are illegal. All right. Yeah. And I think that we really need, I, I think definitions matter. 
you know. Yeah, so I agree, but that doesn't, say, I don't think, win the argument. We can, yeah. So, so go if ahead, we're going, go So if we're going to say that, like, my, my only issue is the fact that the, the mechanism for banning this was to say that this counts as an automatic weapon. Now, there might be some other regulation or some other bylaw or whatever, like some other piece of legislation that could give uh, the executive branch the authority to ban bump stocks. Like, I, I, I don't know. I haven't looked into that. Maybe there is a mechanism for doing that. But if the mechanism for doing that is to classify it as an automatic weapon, when it is not an automatic weapon, there is a difference and there is, an, there is a distinctive definition between what constitutes an automatic weapon and what constitutes a semi-automatic weapon. I, I don't think that I'm not outraged by the fact that they came to that conclusion. Now, I also, it's not, it's also not a hill I'd be willing to die on. Like, sure. you know, if, if like, like if you were to tell me that they, they upheld that, you know, bump stocks should be banned, you know, even with this reasoning, I would be like, well, that's not exactly what it is, but you know, it's probably better that bump stocks are banned that than that they're not banned. Um, you know, that would that would probably still be my point of view on that. And my point of view oh. is still very much, it should be banned. Mm -hmm. And I would love it to be banned through legislation, or if there if there is another reclassification that the Biden administration could use in order to ban it, then by all means do that. But my point is, definitions matter. You know. So I assume you still think I'm wrong, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I totally agree that that definitions matter. I just don't think that saying that, like, is dispositive, if that makes sense. So, like, I think it, it would be disingenuous to say that there is not an actual ambiguity at play here in terms of what the meaning of single function of the trigger is. Because, um, like... The sing like the mechanisms that they governed at the time. There's a reason why they said this. They had used that phrase. Were a wide variety. There were triggers, like like we think today. There were buttons on the sides of of guns. Like there were lots of different things that they were aiming to include. Yeah. And so the idea that like it is clearly wrong. And that you should not defer to a finding of a an expert organization on firearms that a mechanism that serves to drive the same result and I don't know largely like make something the same yeah. doesn't qualify as a function of the trigger. I don't know. Like, what's the trigger of a trigger? Let's say that. Like, if you pre if you if you touch the bump stock one time, and it fires until you no longer touch it, is does it matter that you are a single step removed, given that you're touching the bump stock or like moving your finger on the bump stock rather than the trigger? Does it matter that you're a single step removed? Because like, okay, well, maybe it's never a single function of the trigger because you're not actually moving the firing pin. Yeah. Because a firing pin moves multiple times. And really, the firing pin is the proximate trigger of a piece of ammunition firing from the gun. It's the thing that triggers the thing. Yeah. And so, like, I, I don't know. I feel like it... And and to your point about speed, I think, like, this, the rate of fire, if we're going to be talking about definitions, is, like, I think it's a little bit of a red herring, honestly. Because, like, say we had a superhuman hand who could fire a semi-automatic at 800 rounds a minute <laughs> obviously like you couldn't you couldn't really do that um but i think like in that case like you're just a, a organic person like who can really fire like i think we probably wouldn't say that those that that person can't own a gun or something yeah something like that even though it might qualify for like the the rate of fire so the fact that like one first of all like the there's a venn diagram in the rates of fire that you described but two like the rate of fire is not a qualifying component for the law. Presumably, Tommy guns fired much slower than our, like in the 1930s, fired much slower than our automatic rifles today, perhaps overlapping with the speed of firing with a bump stock. So like, if we're going to talk about like that history, like I don't think rate of fire really drives well, the difference that we're talking that about. That I'd have to actually look up. But um, like one thing yeah. that I do know, like a point that, that my father made when I was talking to him, 
was that um, a bump stock can make can make a gun fire approximately as fast as a Gatling gun. Okay. Which, you know, I think most of us can probably agree a Gatling gun, you know, shouldn't should not be legal. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but I guess I again, I I'm not necessarily saying that it's yeah. bad that the Trump administration did that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And totally. I'm not saying that I'd be outraged if the Supreme Court had ruled the other way. The other way. What I'm yeah, saying yeah. is that I understand. Sure. The this reasoning is not, be behind. Yeah. It. This is not the court running amok. Yeah. This, this isn't this the court is not running them amok. being absolutely crazy. Now, now, the other thing that I would say is that the Trump administration doing that in the first place was a way for Republicans to try to save face because bump stocks are extremely unpopular. All right. Again, I'm yeah, I'm a fairly awkward as fuck. I'm a fairly <laughs> I'm a fairly uh when it comes to guns, I'm I'm a fairly pro gun guy and yeah. I absolutely think they should be banned. Like I mm -hmm. absolutely think that they should be banned and most people do think they should be banned. I've talked to some of the most like, you know, right-wing gun nuts ever sure. and yeah. almost every single one of them have been like, yeah, no, that should be fucking banned. It's ridiculous. <laughs> like like yeah. you know, it's 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 a universally popular thing. The only reason why it's like why it's even a question is, of course, because of the fucking the gun lobby. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that this is one of those issues that really needs that at this point, the path forward is go into legislation, take it, sure. take it into legislation and put Republicans on the record. Are you for this or are you against this? Totally. You know, and I think that's a fair point. And, and Justice Alito, I think, wrote in his concurrence something very much along those lines. And yeah. I'll never, you know, I never try to agree with Justice Alito, but <laughs> basically saying that, you know, just because we have this deadly event, which doesn't really doesn't change the statutory text or its meaning. And so basically, go ahead and outlaw this. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's, that's the real remedy. Yeah. Outlaw it. Just not like this, you know. Okay. Which I love it when we disagree. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> doesn't Me too. happen very often. Um, I doubt that there's going to be much guns more disagreement. And religion. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I think you're right. I think the rest is pretty much a shit sandwich. Now let's talk about fucking Chevron deference. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my fucking God. I'm getting Are you up about kidding me? State. Chevron yeah, deference. Sure. You overturn Chevron deference. <laughs> okay, you okay, sons Nathan. of bitches. Nathan, 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 come on. You gotta calm down. You can't get that worked up over something called Chevron deference. I am worked up over People something think called Chevron deference. Stroke. <laughs> so, Michael, what what is Chevron deference? Okay, great question. Okay, so Chevron deference is a doctrine that was developed uh, during the Reagan era by the Supreme Court uh, in a case ball called Chevron USA versus Natural Resources Defense Council in the 1980s. Um, and basically, it has become like the law <clears throat> underpinning um, the ability for administrative agencies really to, to be able to functionally do their job. But really what Severance, Chevron Deference does is that it tells courts that they should defer to how the experts at, feder at, 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 at federal agencies interpret the laws that they are charged with enforcing and, and implementing. And so basically, as long as their interpretations are reasonable, like, you know, not like really far outside of the legislative uh, scope that they were granted, that, you know, the courts should defer to them in in, in the interpretation of the laws that they were, were granted to enforce. Yeah. Um, and this is like, and this is meant to do a couple of things. One, it's meant to enable these agencies to function without constantly being sued and without, you know, courts constantly finding um, that like various actions of theirs were in or outside of the bounds and constantly being held up. So basically that they can actually function. But two, it's also it's dependent on the idea that these agencies are supposed to be the experts in the matter. Yeah. They are like not only the experts in the law that governs them, but also the experts in the specifics of the uh, area of the you know uh, the area of law that they are responsible for enforcing and upholding yeah and so ultimately like it is the one of the main doctrines that underpins the ability for executive agencies which you know get 
a uh, grant from Congress to take the actions, right? Like a law is written to en- endow a, an executive agency with uh, the power to do X, Y, and Z. And it, this is the thing that basically says, yeah, courts, don't put yourselves in the middle of it unless there's like a really good reason. Yeah, exactly. So there are many reasons why this makes total sense. First mm-hmm. off, it makes sense for the Congress to defer to these executive agencies are on, mm-hmm. on certain issues because people in Congress aren't experts on these issues, right? Totally. The people in these agencies are experts on it. Now, one of the things that we've talked about in a previous episode is that a huge portion of the federal government, of the executive branch, mm-hmm. a huge portion of the employees are not political appointees. They're not people that are necessarily directly going along with some political agenda. They're people that just know how to run shit, like just yeah. know how to run <laughs> things because yeah. they have expertise in, in in the environment. They have expertise in in medicine. They have expertise in farming. Mm-hmm. You know, and it makes sense that people in Congress that are not experts on these issues, and people in the courts who are experts on on the law and not these issues. Mm-hmm. Defer to the defer to the judgment of these individuals. Now, of course, within reason, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. that's why the like the, the specific reason why Congress would kind of ambiguously give power to an agency is because Congress doesn't fucking understand what they do. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like you think you think fucking Johnny Utah from Hawaii knows like, oh yeah, so you know. This is the these are the complex factors that lead to uh, to a farm turning an entire course of land into the Dust Bowl. (laughs) You know, the Dust Bowl happened because of a lack of regulation, Hmm. you know, and some fucking person in Congress does not understand how that works. But a person in, you know, the Department of Agriculture Mm -hmm. probably does. Yeah. Right. So we want them to be making those decisions now. Yeah. I know that a lot of people get, you know, get annoyed by federal bureaucracy as as a point of principle. You know, bureaucracy can be annoying. Like bureaucracy can be uh, unbearable. But one thing mm-hmm. one thing to consider and this is actually a point that uh, I've been talking I was talking to my wife about this and a point that she made is you need to consider that this isn't to say that every single regulation needs to be there, but almost mm-hmm. every single regulation usually uh represents some people who have died. Hmm. Like interesting because that was not there. So, so hmm. for example, you ever notice that semi trucks have that thing hanging underneath them, like have that little bar that hangs up in the that hangs down in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, something that uh, for the for the longest time I actually thought like, oh, that's just so people can like step up and get into stuff. Mm-hmm. No, that was yeah. actually a regulation, and it has saved countless lives because hmm. what was happening is if a person rear-ended a semi truck. They would get decapitated. Oh, my God. But because that's there, it prevents people from getting decapitated. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, that leads directly to the other purpose, the other key function of administrative and and executive agencies, which is expediency. Yeah. Change with the times. You don't want to have Congress, yeah, like go through a fucking legislative session and like have to argue over all of these other things to make a bill that does X, Y, and Z just to be able to require the tractor trailers have a guard on the back that prevents people's heads from getting cut off. Yeah. Like that you want an executive agency that governs the safety of our highways to say, yep, if you're going to drive on our highways, which we regulate, you're going to make sure that un- under a basic rear ending scenario, no one's head gets cut off. That yeah. seems pretty un- yeah. <laughs> unambiguous to me. Yeah. And, and given, given the fact that Congress is in an almost like constant state of gridlock. Yeah. Like you got to get those you got to get those regulations out there in response to potential dangers mm-hmm. so that you can save lives. Yeah. All right? Yeah. This allows for federal agencies to change with the times. Mm-hmm. All right? That way they can follow the spirit of the law beyond just the wording of it. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And so the U.S. Supreme Court was like, you know what? What if we took a shit on that? 
Yeah. What if we gobbled that up and then shit it out and then shit on it again? Yeah. So <laughs> this is so you might ask, why the fuck would anybody be against this? Well, it's basically because we have this like push on the far right for massive deregulation. They yeah. think regulation it's because itself we it's because we live in a fucking evil. oligarchy that specifically yeah. handpicked all of these justices yeah. that now run our fucking lives. Mm hmm. And these oligarchs that fund the Federalist Society, mm -hmm. they don't want to have to spend an extra two bucks on some simple ass reg on some simple ass uh, safety feature in their factories, mm -hmm. even if it's going to even if it kills people. Nathan, if you don't want to get decapitated. Don't rear end a truck, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so the U.S. Supreme Court overturned basically one of its most important decisions ever. Uh, it has been in place for 40 years, as we mentioned. Uh, it has been the guide to how the federal government works and makes policy in critical areas of life from food and drug to environmental protection. And, of course, along ideological lines, the court voted 6-3, not just to like skirt around this or whatever, but directly to overturn it. Um, so writing in the opinion of the court, John Roberts said specifically, Chevron deference is, quote, overruled. He called the legal theory uh, gravely erred and called it misguided and unworkable, despite the fact that it has literally steered our federal government for 40 years. Um, misguided and, and unworkable. Man, put, yeah. put that on his fucking resume. Yeah. He, he wrote, quote, agencies have no special competence in resolving statutory ambiguities. That's... Courts do. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you no, don't. No, you don't. Exactly. Jesus Christ. No, you don't. Yeah. Like the whole point of filling an agency with non-political appointees is so that the people that make those decisions are the people that actually understand it. They don't care about, like... <laughs> yeah. They don't care about appealing to a certain amount of voters that don't understand how the goddamn environment works or how mm -hmm. farming works. Yeah. And, you know, the, exactly. one of the sad parts is I actually kind of agree with the plaintiffs in this, like their original mm -hmm. gripe. Sure. Because this, this all started because during the Trump administration, um, there was this... There was this federal regulation that made it that they changed that made it so that um, when uh, fishing vessels, when herring fishermen like went out into the water, that uh, they had to cover the cost of federal monitors on those fishing trips. Now, previously, the federal monitors were required, but they weren't they didn't have to brunt the cost of it. Mm hmm. And the Trump administration changed it so they would now have to brunt the cost of it. Now, I look at that and I say, yeah, that's bullshit. Like yeah. the, the federal Trump government made it worse. Yeah. The federal government should absolutely mm -hmm. like uh, cover the cost of federal monitors. You know, and, and I told it totally makes sense to me that you'd want to sue and be like, yeah, no, this is bullshit. But the fact that they used this in order to overturn the entirety of Chevron deference. Yep. It's just yeah. insane. It is absolutely it is, fucking insane. It is insanity. And it is, again, this is a runaway ideological right wing court yeah. that is they're, losing yeah. its credibility with every single bullshit Seriously. ruling they're putting out there. And it's not even like this is like, a, like I don't know, who who is, who, why are they so ideological over just the function of government? Like, this is not religion. This is not, like, this is not life. You know, this is, like, just grinding our government to a halt. So Elena Kagan in her dissent wrote that uh, that uh, this overturns basically, quote, a cornerstone of administrative law. Um, because, she said, quote, Congress knows that it does not, in fact, write perfectly compete regulatory statutes. It knows that those statutes will inevitably contain ambiguities and that some other actor will have to resolve and gaps that some other actor will have to fill. And it would usually prefer that actor to be the responsible agency, not the court. So, quote, in one fell swoop, the majority today gives itself exclusive power over every open issue, no matter how expertise-driven or policy-laden uh, involving the meaning of regulatory law. Yeah. The majority disdains restraint and grasps for power. And what this basically means is that 
these federal agencies are no longer going to be able to uh, regulate clean water the way that they used to. Mm -hmm. All right. So water is going to be more of a concern. Mm -hmm. um, air pollution, you know, yeah. fossil healthcare. fuels, <laughs> healthcare, like yeah. fossil, like fucking. This has been one of this has been like one of the hottest summers on record, mm -hmm. if not the hottest summer. We are like we got that new UN report that basically said we're barreling towards the climate apocalypse. And meanwhile, the Supreme Court is all like, you know what? Let's speed that shit up. Mm -hmm. You know, fuck the world. We'll make a couple bucks in the meantime. Make a couple bucks in the meantime. <laughs> speed. Up. Yeah. Jesus. These. These pieces of shit. And. Yeah. <laughs> and. It, Adding to their piece of shittiness, let's talk about homelessness. Dude. dude. Oh, we my are God. To, yeah, seriously. Like, we have so many more cases to talk through. <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah. And, and like, we are just starting to scratch the surface. We've covered, you know, their irresponsibility with regard to government. You know, we've given them a little bit of credit. Now we're diving into, like, some of the really bad shit. This decision is just fucking cruel. Yeah. This Absolutely is Absolutely cruel. This is evil. Like this is just yeah. pure evil. I yeah. I like there's no other way of saying this. This is just mm -hmm. evil, hideous, heinous, heartless. Yeah. I I I I am stunned. I am mm -hmm. stunned by this decision. You know, given how fucking horrible these people already are, like I shouldn't be stunned by any decision they make, but I yeah. am stunned by this. Oh my yeah. god. So there was this, so there's this uh, town in Oregon um, called Grants Pass that passed a law that basically said that homeless people could be arrested for sleeping on public land. Mm -hmm. Now, now this was this was challenged as basically a violation of the constitutional the constitution's eighth amendment against cruel and unusual punishments basically mm -hmm. saying if you are refusing to let people sleep that is a mm -hmm. cruel and unusual punishment because literally of course it is torture like it actually is, yeah. though like it is a method of torture yeah it is used it is a method of torture sleeping. like yeah. keeping people from sleeping sleep deprivation is a method of torture mm -hmm. which is something i keep trying to tell my daughter <laughs> But like, good. so they, so a lower court ruled that. Yeah. Which was not novel. Yeah. Right. This refers back to another decision from 2018 called Martin v. Boise, which said that criminalizing sleeping outside when a shelter is unavailable yeah. violated the Eighth Amendment. So basically it's saying you can tell people that they're not allowed to sleep outside. You have to give them a place to sleep. Yeah. If you're and going to criminalize them sleeping outside and this particular law in Grants Pass prohibited them from using a blanket, a pillow, a cardboard box for protection of from the elements. So basically like just making sure that you know you couldn't sleep outside and gave them no alternative. Yeah. Like now critics will say there was uh there was like some Christian missions uh that they could have gone to, but these Christian missions drug tested hmm. which, you know, look look, I know that there's a lot of stigma about um, homeless people using drugs or alcohol. And I, I somewhat get that. But the fact of the matter is, like, these are people who society has failed. Yeah. Um, these are people that society has failed to give any options in life. And when you have no options in life, you're more likely to turn towards stuff like that. Totally. I'm and, not saying that also, that's a good thing. Like, yeah. But you're more likely to turn to stuff like that. Also, these missions required them to attend services. Mm. Which basically means that the government is, if, if, if attending a church service is the only option to sleep and your alternative is criminal, then the government is forcing you to go to church. Yeah. Which I don't think that was an issue actually raised in this case, but like that would be a violation of the First Amendment. So Absolutely. Not cool. Um, yeah. And that's the thing. To your point, like, yeah, there might be, there's stigma around unhoused people. And yeah, drug use and all of this stuff. But like, regardless of that stigma, criminalizing a biological necessity, as Sonia Sotomayor, Justice Sotomayor referred in her dissent, 
just makes all of those things worse. Yeah. Like the whole thing here is that if you criminalize sleeping outside and provide no alternative, you are like, you know, obviously that's a cruel treatment of someone, but also you're just passing the buck. You're just like forcing these people to stay on the move and yeah, not being able to fucking sleep. No, you're, you're pretty much criminalizing the existence of homeless people. Exactly. Yeah. Which is like something that is typically a principle of our law. Not to do, you don't criminalize someone for being something. Yeah. You criminalize actions and acts, but you don't criminal like, like even like restrictions on, you know, being, being gay back in the day actually weren't, like they didn't make being gay illegal. They made certain kinds of acts illegal. Now those are yeah. terrible laws, obviously, and, and not a great example of like a good law. But like even then, they had the restraint to not say, "Oh, you just can't be this thing," um, because status crimes are not like recognized as legitimate forms of crime. Yeah. So the, the city was basically arguing that they needed these laws in place to protect public safety. Like, how else could we possibly? Uh, hmm. deal with the homelessness crisis. Well, Utah might actually have something to say about that. Uh, we've actually talked about this in a previous pod. It was actually one of our really early pods. But um, there's actually a very simple way of addressing homelessness that is massively effective mm-hmm. and is actually pretty straightforward. Like people say, well, homelessness is a complex issue. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. And Utah proved that. So what did Utah do? They gave people homes. Yeah. Like, that's literally what they did. They gave people homes. All right? They fought chronic homelessness through this 10-year program that involved building housing and giving people homes. And it was was colossally effective. It actually Mm -hmm. saved taxpayer money because, you know, whenever... uh, the cops have to pull somebody in from the street uh, for, you know, for breaking a law or whatever, or for, for sleeping where they're not supposed to, that is taxpayer money. All right. Yeah. Whenever an, an ambulance has to be called because someone, uh, because a homeless person um, got hurt, that is taxpayer yeah. money. All right. It yeah. saved money. And what's, what's, what's funny is that I was, I was remembering that segment and I actually, I, I looked up, I was looking up an article and I was like, okay, you know, let me, let me get the exact numbers on that. And the first article, one of the first articles I found was basically saying, you know, like, oh, they say that, um, Utah solved homelessness, but the reality is more complicated. And I was like, oh shit, is there something that I missed? So I was looking at the article and they were like, yeah, so, uh, and this is this is an article in the uh, Salt Lake Tribune. And they were basically saying, yeah, so, you know, the way that they measured the methodology for measuring homelessness in 2000, in 2005 versus 2015 were, were like different methods of measuring homelessness. Uh, so it's a little misleading because like the claim was we reduced chronic homelessness by 90%. And I was like, oh, shit. So like so it was so they didn't reduce it by ninety percent. It's just a flawed in methodology. Like they just manipulated the numbers. Mm-hmm. Shit. So how much did they actually reduce it? And it's like, yeah, well if they if they counted it realistically, then they actually only reduced it by seventy percent. And I was like, holy shit, seventy so percent. <laughs> that is a massive success. Yeah, that seriously. is a massive success. And this was a ten year program. Mm-hmm. This was a ten year program that, to their own admission, would have been more successful if they had more resources. Yeah. The prob- so the problem with homelessness is purely political. Yes. All right. It is, it is purely decision. political. All right. Homelessness is a decision, but it is a collective decision. We yeah. decide to allow homelessness. If mm-hmm. we actually invested resources collectively as a country in just giving people homes in a universal housing program. We would reduce, we would, we would, we could eliminate homelessness. Yes. And we would reduce the tax burden. It would actually save taxpayer money. Mm-hmm. All right. By, by causing, by creating more enforcement, by criminalizing homelessness further as this law does, you are actually costing the taxpayers more money. Yeah. Because you are, because you are allocating resources to fighting this, to, to, 
you know, to criminalizing these people and giving them a criminal record, which in turn makes it harder for them to get a job mm -hmm. later, which in turn makes it harder for them to become to become tax paying citizens. Yeah, it's like fucking mind blowing how many studies there are on something that is actually so simple. Yeah, <laughs> and like study after study is like, yep, turns out, give them a little bit of money, that'd do it. Yeah, give them a home, that'd do it. Like, there's like a lot of studies that that come to this conclusion. Uh, the National Homelessness Law Center called the decision profoundly disappointing and stated, "quote Arresting or finding people for trying to survive is expensive, counterproductive, and cruel. This inhumane ruling will make homelessness worse in Grants Pass and nationwide. Cities are now even more empowered to neglect proven." housing based solutions and to arrest or find those with no choice but to sleep outside and yet in the majority decision 6-3 ruling that uh punishing people for not having a home and sleeping outside ruling that this is not cruel and unusual punishment neil gorsuch wrote quote homelessness is complex its causes are many so may be the public policy responses required to address it. A handful of federal judges cannot begin to match the collective wisdom the American people possess in deciding how best to handle a pressing social question like homelessness. Your job as a judge is to protect people. Mm -hmm. All right? The reason why we have a republic and not a pure direct democracy. The reason why we have a, a republic is because we are governed by the rule of law, mm -hmm. meaning that the tyranny of the majority cannot impose on the civil rights, the constitutional rights of the minority. Mm -hmm. To say that people whose society has failed, all right, that's like that's the only way you can characterize homeless people. All right, yeah. these are people that society has failed to say that they should be further punished for just trying to fucking sleep by the tyranny of the majority who have this, you know, who had the who have this visceral reaction to seeing some person in ratty clothes in a public park, which again if you actually don't want to see a person in ratty clothes in a public park, there is a solution to that. But the fact, the fact that you are not operating as that function in that function, the fact that you are that you are claiming that as a judge, as a protector of the rule of law, that you have no authority over protecting the fundamental rights of people's uh, of 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 people's basic right to sleep, a basic biological function. One of the one of the comparisons that Sotomayor used is breathing. You know, mm -hmm. would you criminal? Yeah. Would you say that people can't breathe in public? Of course, you wouldn't say that. People can actually die of not sleeping. Mm -hmm. That actually can happen. It is a biological necessity to sleep. A biological necessity. Just yeah, comically evil. Just comically <sighs> evil. And now it's time for a more lighthearted segment, Good Actually. So, Nathan, what is a good actually? Michael, a good actually is something that we do because the world sucks. Yeah. The world is a pile of dog shit. Sure is. Especially it's a pile when of... it's governed by <laughs> six douchebags <laughs> flowery language. It's a pile of dog shit interlaced with the vomit of a hognose snake. Mm. All baked in a gas oven and seasoned with the uh the the piss of a groundhog that just ate a bunch of asparagus. Oh <laughs> Jesus. I but, didn't think it was that bad. <laughs> but sometimes Okay. Oh but okay, sometimes that's where I'm from. yeah. But sometimes, yeah. all right? Mm hmm When you take that shit out and you start you start really digging through it. Mm-hmm. You realize, wait a minute. Wow. The whichever dog ate whichever dog shit this out, um, they actually they ate a uh, a a gold coin 
before oh, wow. you know and 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 now i have found this gold coin inside this shit and it's and it's it's be- it's a beautiful gold coin it's it costs a lot of money and you're like this is valuable this is great and then you then suddenly you you stick your head up and you see oh my god there's a gold coin over there and oh my god there's a gold coin over there this is good good actually is all around us wait sorry just to go back on that <laughs> There were good coins, gold coins all around you, but you only found one because you were rifling through a sick dog's shit. Well, because I was focusing <laughs> on the bad. You know, I was focusing oh, on the bad. Oh, I see. And as soon I as I found the, good, found the good, I was able to see the other gold coins. Makes that, sense. Well, that, yeah. that really clears that up. No more questions <laughs> from my side. <laughs> hey, it's hard to come up with these. Yeah, I know. It's hard. What we do is the hardest job that there is. Yep. Uh, <laughs> So, Nathan, what is our good actually this week? Well, Michael, kind of in theme with uh, what we just talked about regarding the uh, the uh, horrific ruling by the Supreme Court about homelessness, we actually have some good news about homelessness. Hmm. All right. Some actually legitimate, good policy news that we can all celebrate. So Denver, Colorado did this... Uh, did this pilot program that they called the Denver Basic Income Project. And the way that this worked is they would take people that were living in the streets, in shelters, on friends' couches and vehicles, basically homeless people in Denver, Colorado, Mm -hmm. and they would put them into three different groups for this pilot program. Uh, Group number one would receive... $1,000 $1,000 per month for a year. Group B would receive uh, $6,500 in the first month and then $500 for the next 11 months. And then Group C, which is the control group, uh, would just receive 50 bucks per month, which is still pretty significant. Yeah. By the time the 10-month check-in came around, 45% of participants from all three of the groups were living in a house or an apartment that they rented or owned. Hmm. 45%. Yeah, wow. Almost half, and this is after just 10 months. Mm -hmm. After just 10 months of being involved in this program, almost half of these participants had homes. Many of them have jobs. And researchers estimated that the project because they be, because this saved money in public services, including ambulance rides, visits to hospitals, emergency departments, uh, jail stays overnights, and shelter nights, th- this program saved the city uh, $589,214. Hmm. So they not o- with this program, they not only like cut in half the number of homeless people that were a part of this, all right, the number of people who were homeless that were a part of this, they saved over a half a million dollars. Hmm. They saved the city over a half a million dollars. This is a colossal, colossal success. All right? Seriously. And the fact that people's lives are, are like, were actually affected. Uh, one participant, a mother of two named Anita, Um, And this is all according to the Colorado Sun. Uh, She is now living with a family member after previously living in her car or outside. She told researchers that the monthly payments she received were a leg up, and she now relies on the payments for hygiene items, uh, child care expenses, transportation, and other bills. Another participant, a single mother who who lives with her parents, said she was able to start a new job, buy a car, and enroll in school. She also reported that she was able to make happy memories with her children and is looking forward to moving into her own housing. That is awesome. That is unambiguously good. Yeah, it this is. This is a great program. And this was just a 10-month check-in. Yeah. Let's see Two how more it months to go. Let's see how it continues. <laughs> that is awesome. That really is good news. And that's good actually. Okay, so now for round two of telling everyone why the Supreme Court 
wants to fuck you in the ass. Um, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I mean, at least they didn't overturn the Lawrence decision. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. They don't want to. They don't want to fuck you in the ass. A six-three majority by ideological lines has already fucked you in the ass. <laughs> okay, um, so let's talk about Mtala. So this decision is a little bit complicated because it's a little ambiguous. But don't worry, don't worry, it's still bad news. Um, oh, good. So yeah, <laughs> so Idaho, uh, one of our amazing fifty states that uh, likes to ban abortions, uh, they have sought to make. Uh, abortion exempted from uh, EMTALA, which is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, which requires that hospitals that receive federal dollars stabilize the health of patients who show up at their emergency rooms with medical emergencies. Um, so basically they're trying to say that just because you show up with a pregnancy-related medical emergency doesn't mean that a, a abortion can be uh, required even for stabilizing care. So, like, if you have, if you need an abortion to stabilize you, they can be like, "Sorry, we don't need to do that. Not going to do that." Um, Mtala is effectively the American people's only universal right to health care, um, and because of its relationship to abortion, has been like in the crosshairs since uh, the Dobbs decision. So, this is specifically at at issue in. Idaho, because uh, while a lot of states allow doctors to perform an emergency ab abortion when a woman's life or health is at risk, in Idaho, doctors are only allowed to intervene uh, with an abortion when a woman is on the brink of death. So basically, they're trying to say, they're trying to, you know, make sure that the federal government can't force them to commit abortions that will save lives um so the reason i say this is a little bit complicated is because ostensibly this is good news the justices uh after having reached down and grabbing this case and pulling it up uh voted 6-3 actually to dismiss the case deferring to the lower court's ruling that emtala still covers abortion and still requires that abortions can be provided can be can be required to be provided for stabilizing care um, and so, you know, it records, you know, preserves that lower court's order. Um, and the opinion here was actually written by Elena Kagan, um, and, uh, was also joined by Sonia Sotomayor. And so like, you know, you got some liberal justices on, on this as well. Another opinion was written by Amy Coney Barrett. Like the court was pretty divided over exactly the rationale here, but the reason why, I want to say that this is not like unambiguously a good decision is because it's pretty clear that the justices only like at least the conservative justices only decided to dismiss this case because they didn't want another Dobbs like impact on the election. So basically they had like proactively kind of grabbed this case to review this particular information um, and then concluded later that uh, the the conservative justices concluded later that the briefing and oral argument kind of changed their understanding of the case enough that the that taking the litigation was a quote miscalculation. So basically, every, uh, the legal experts agree they are kicking this can down the road um, and trying to not resolve this question conclusively uh, until some later date. So which led actually Katanji Brown Jackson. Uh, who partially join in, in Kagan's opinion, to write a separate dissent from the dismissal of the case. And she said, quote, It is too little, too late for the court to take a mulligan and just tell the lower courts to carry on as, this, as if none of this has happened. Today's decision is not a victory for pregnant patients in Idaho. It's a delay. While this court dawdles and the country waits, pregnant people experiencing emergency medical conditions remain in precarious positions as their doctors are kept in the dark about what the law requires. This court had a chance to bring clarity and certainty to this tragic situation, and we have squandered it. So basically, the law remains ambiguous. The dismissal doesn't reach a specific conclusion. It's pretty clear that the court is going to try to tackle something like this in a cleaner case at some point in the future, and that this is an opportunity for them to avoid 
a political impact like the one they had with Dobbs in 2022, where it helped push uh, the country in the more liberal direction on the back of the abortion issue. Yeah. So this thing is not to bed yet. Well, and that's also that's also something that we've talked about, the fact that yeah. even in these cases where states have a specific exception for life of the mother, that's almost never yeah like that's that that that's that's never sufficient yeah you know this, totally. this, because, this is yeah yeah this this is the big reason why i i don't actually believe in restrictions on abortion yeah because the way that they're interpreted is well unless you're dying on the operating table we're not going to do it exactly yeah and and ultimately that makes sense like as a medical establishment or a doctor if your alternatives are like lose your license you know, be jailed, yeah. be fined, and err on the side of versus like err on the side of more risk for your patient. Your incentives are to just accept more risk to your patient. You're going to go home at the end of the day either way. Yeah. 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 Um, I do have one other decision that I really want to talk about that isn't as flashy okay. or as exciting as. Uh, some of these other ones, but it has to do with one of our favorite uh, concepts on this show, which is corruption. Ooh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so the case here is Snyder I love v. Corruption. US. Yeah, we love it. And so does this Supreme Court. <laughs> and, uh... and we know that not just because they get flown around, not just because they have people that that they are friends with and pay uh, you know, to take good care of them who then bring information in front of the court. We know this court loves corruption because they write these things down, like the one, like they're, what they're writing down in this opinion here. Um, so in Snyder v. v. U.S. is about a federal statute which is used to prosecute corruption in government officials. Um, and so uh, specifically at issue here is Section 666, which... Oh, man, the devil's <laughs> number. No wonder they wanted to strike this down. Uh, which prohibits state and local officials from corruptly soliciting, demanding, or accepting anything of value uh, intended to be, uh, intended to, like, influence or uh, to reward them in connection with their government business. So this is, like, basic bribery, Yeah. right? If you get something of value that's intended to influence or reward you and you've corruptly solicited it, that is bribery. So James Snyder was a former small town mayor in Indiana. He was awarding contracts to a trucking company, uh, specifically like pushing like contracts towards this one trucking company. And then when he ran into financial trouble, uh, he went to the trucking company asking them for money and they gave him like 13,000 bucks. Um, and then he was prosecuted for it. And, Again, like this federal law bans corruptly soliciting, demanding, accepting, or agreeing to accept anything of value more than five thousand dollars. So it kind of has a limit on the minimum value. Um, and at issue in this case, basically Snyder argued that it has to be, it has to explicitly be a quid pro quo uh, arrangement, and that essentially the compensation cannot be provided after the fact. What a load of horseshit. <laughs> yeah, isn't that crazy? So the government argued, obviously, that corruption includes basically anytime you know what you're doing is unlawful, wrongful, uh, and uh, that you have the consciousness of wrongdoing. And then Ar and Snyder argued that this uh, that basically only deliberate wrongful agreement to a quid pro quo uh, qualifies as bribery. And so... Surprise, surprise, somehow this fucking court sided with Snyder. <laughs> so does that basically mean... Bribery's that, on the table, baby. <laughs> that, that, so that basically means that um, if a senator votes the way I want him to, I can give him a house. Yes. And that's not bribery. Yes. Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, my they, god. They basically ruled that so long as a gift is given as a reward wow. after the official performs wow. the corrupt act, no crime occurs. I don't know about you. My job pays me after I do my job. I guess that's just a gift now. <laughs> so <laughs> literally, Justice wow. Kavanaugh uh What a dumb decision. Isn't that crazy? Justice Kavanaugh concluded that 
The statute prohibits bribes that are paid before the commission of a corrupt official act. It does not cover gratuities, even though it literally says rewards, not awards, rewards. Um, so, so people in Congress can start setting up tip jars, basically. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and, well, it happens after. And and corporations. God damn, you, you don't even need super PACs anymore. No, no, <laughs> Jesus you don't. Christ. <laughs> Jesus, yeah. that is, oh my God, that is, that is so wrong. Yeah. And this, this should have gotten a lot more coverage. I think so too. This is like a big deal and it is like barely a blip on the radar. So the reason the court held this is that they claimed that the statue would otherwise fail to provide fair notice as to whether conduct was criminal. A couple things. One, it's written down in a statute. Yeah. <laughs> and two, knowledge of the law or, or ignorance of the law is not a defense from the law. There's no nothing that requires that someone knows whether they're breaking the law or not before they can be prosecuted for breaking the law. Yeah. So, yeah. So Justice Kavanaugh wrote, is a $100 Dunkin' Donuts gift card for a trash collector wrongful? What about a $200 Nike gift card for a, co a county commissioner who voted to fund new school athletic facilities? Could Doesn't students it specifically say 5000 though? <laughs> yes. It specifically, like the exactly. law specifically says over $5,000. Yeah. But dude, Are you he's kidding obsessed me? with making sure he gets small dollar gift cards as <laughs> a Supreme Court justice that Are is you kidding really me? important so to him. What about, so yeah, what about these counter examples that the law that, already, like, th exempts. that don't apply here? Yep. At all, yep. Like, could I, Would, could I, could I give a trash co collector, you know, a a five a hundred dollar gift card? Yes, you can. You can't give them a five thousand yeah. dollar gift card. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, exactly. And actually, I mean, you might be able to give them a five thousand dollar gift card. Can you give them a five thousand dollar gift card after they agree to stop collecting trash from a competing business? No. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what yeah. a dumb counter example! Isn't that what it a crazy? Oh my god. Oh yeah. my god! Yeah. And the, by the way, I would just like to point out this is a case that, like, I I I rem my dad briefly mentions to me, mm -hmm. um, but I actually I, I didn't look up a lot of it about it before the before the pod. This was mainly yeah. Michael leading this. Yeah, yeah. I like that one detail is something that I apparently like. I apparently have a better understanding of this law than fucking Brett Kavanaugh, <laughs> dude. I mean, just from listening to ten minutes of Michael and, talking about it. What if someone wants to give me a beer? I like beer. <laughs> I like beer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, and so, unless it's a five thousand dollar beer, you're yeah, fine. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and and in addition to that, like. There is corrupt intent required. Yeah. Like that is the thing that is the, the precursor to bribery is that it is a it is wrongful. It is corrupt. Like that is the requirement. So it's not like a gift could just automatically be bribery. It's like you prove the elements of the crime, which involves proving intent. Like we have protections for this. We do prosecute bribes already and we do it like constitutionally. So. Uh, Justice Jackson shredded this motherfucker uh, in her dissent. Uh, so she called this uh, ruling absurd and atextual reading of the statute uh, is one only today's court could love. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Uh, so first, she she wrote about how the language of the statute specifically includes the word reward and uh, blasted the majority for elevating the quote, non-existent federalism concerns over the plain text of the statute, which we don't have to get into right now. Um, she criticized majority for taking the view that Section 666 would, like, give too much power to federal prosecutors for prosecuting this crime um, and and all this stuff. Basically, like, there's a whole section in, in the opinion focused on, like, how, like like, basically, is this law one that we would actually want to have on the books is essentially what, what this is going after. And she basically says like, guys, Congress already passed it. Yeah. It's already a law. It's if it's not unconstitutional, we don't have a right to review this kind of thing. Yeah. Um. So second, she talks about how there's to your point already limiting language in section six, six, six. So already providing a, sta a, ta a statutory limit um, on gifts. So like she says, quote, 
prosecution of the gift cards, burrito bowls, and steak dinners that derail the decisions are like not really concerns, which is your point as well. Yeah. Um, and importantly, critically, the stat and she describes how the statute only applies to conduct that is committed corruptly. The court, she wrote, uh, has previously defined corrupt to mean, quote, wrongful, immoral, depraved, or evil conduct requiring, quote, consciousness of wrongdoing. So it's basically like you are just, they're just making this up. They're basically dismantling the idea of having intent for a crime. Um, and as a result, they are just fucking like destroying any protection that we have, which is already weak and, you know, and doesn't protect us fully from bribes or like yeah. from corruption related to bribery. Uh, and they're just, um, just, we, we already had legalized bribery because of a dumbass decision that the Supreme court made. Yeah. And now they're moving even further in that direction. Yep. So that is the second most corrupt thing that the Supreme court has done. <sighs> Should we get to the first? Let's get to the first. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. In any in any reality that made sense, this would have been laughed out of the courtroom. Yes. Like this would just immediately have been laughed out of the courtroom by anybody. By like th this should have been unanimously, not just not just denied, just it should have just been it should have been laughed at. Like yeah. there should have been like when when this got onto the desk of each of the Supreme Court justices, the response should literally have just been a five second video of all of them just laughing, because this yep. is so fucking ridiculous. Yep. So we are of course talking about the Trump immunity case. So this this is uh, related to uh, the special prosecutor Jack Smith's case in D.C. So in this D.C. trial, uh, Trump faces four felony counts in connection with. Uh, his plan to overturn uh, the 2020 election and Biden's victory. So he faces one, conspir conspiring to defraud the United States, two, conspiring to obstruct the formal certification in, Congress's, uh, in Congress of Biden's victory, two, obstructing a congressional proceeding, uh, and three, conspiracy against rights, which in this case is the right to vote. Um, this has already been reviewed by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, which, of course, to Nathan's point, concluded that uh, presidents are not forever immune from the actions that they took while president. Um, and, yeah. you know, and and which makes sense because, yeah, we are supposed to live in a republic, which, as as I've said many times, republic means rule of law, which nobody is is above. That's yep. what a republic means. That's yep. what it means to be a republic. Rule of law, nobody is above it. So of course mm -hmm. that, uh, of course, <laughs> the lower court ruled that because it's fucking obvious. Yep. Do we live in a republic? Yes, we live in a republic. Boom. End Doesn't of case. Yeah. We're done. Exactly. We're done. Exactly. Let's go home. We're done. And the Supreme Court was like, to quote Nathan, my inimitable podcast co-host, hold my beer. <laughs> uh so again, to which kavanaugh responded i got you yeah he's like oh can i have a sip can i have, I like, can I have I some like of beer. it i, I like have a beer. beer tax uh this is the only kind of tax that isn't theft is a beer tax <laughs> um so yeah again along ideological lines six three conservative supermajority against liberal justices they found that, quote, this is from John Roberts, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts' opinion, because, of course, you got to have the Chief Justice author the most important case of the term, uh, the most important shit stack of the term. Um, he said, quote, a president may not be prosecuted for exercising his core constitutional powers, and he is entitled at a minimum to a presumptive immunity from prosecution for all his official acts. He did say that the president enjoys no immunity for his unofficial acts, and not everything the president does is official. And that was his nod to, quote, the president is not above the law. Yeah. He so even, claimed, the he even claimed, like, yeah, 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 no, the president, he insisted that the president is not above the law. Yeah. To which Sotomayor uh, responded by saying, in every use of official power, the president is now a king above the law, which is absolutely true. 
I mean, he said it. He said in his in ex- exercising his core constitutional powers. So, so as I was reading into this case, right, I had a question. Because my understanding was basically like, as the president executes his constitutional duties, he is immune, which would be p- like a pretty far-reaching decision and would put the president well on his way to king status. Yeah, there, but there's then I thought, nothing in the Constitution that says that. But then I thought, okay, well, logically, how could a president whose official duties are to faithfully execute the laws of the United States, right? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be a logical impossibility and therefore disqualifying for the president's official duties to include unlawful acts? So my thought was like, oh, this court is wrong, but there's a logical problem here that we can probably go after, which is if something is an official duty, then it can't be unlawful. And if it is unlawful, then it can't be an official duty. Except that misunderstanding substitutes core constitutional duties for core constitutional powers. Yeah. So it is not saying that when you execute your job as president, you're immune. What it is saying is that when you do anything that a president is able to do, you are immune. Which means, to Nathan's point, that there are no laws that apply to the president as long as his actions are not purely personal. Well, I can't say purely personal. The The action that resulted from this is that the cases will be you know, sent back down to the D.C. court, and they will determine which actions count as official duties or not. But it's pretty clear that or I shouldn't say official duties. I keep making that mistake because that's the only thing that could possibly make sense, official powers or not. Yeah. So one thing that this means is that uh, the president is absolutely immune from uh, any conduct Mm -hmm. involving discussions with the Justice Department, which basically means that all of those instances of uh, pressuring a, a public servant to violate their oath of office. Yep. That's he's immune. immune. He's immune. Immune. Yeah. Um and it furthermore, means that this the the opinion even bars prosecutors from presenting immunized official acts as trial evidence. So you can't even present it as evidence for yeah. some other thing, which, which is I think really important. You can't present the fact that he consulted on some corrupt thing as evidence that he had some like did other some other uh, unofficial act corruptly. Like, all of a sudden, any of his acts are totally untouchable. Yeah. Which, as a tiny little bone, uh, Amy Coney Barrett actually did dissent on that aspect Mm -hmm. of the ruling, um, saying that context does matter. Yeah. And uh, another thing that that, that seems like is is going to be the case as well is that uh, he will presumably be immune for uh, uh, immune to the allegations of pressuring Mike Pence mm-hmm. to violate his oath of office. Yeah. That uh, basically the, the, the fake elector scheme mm-hmm. that uh, there are significant pieces of evidence that will not be allowed to be used in that yep. case. Yeah. And it, it, it might not even, and it might not even be legal, but that will be up to the lower courts. Basically, what they're saying is um, the lower courts no longer need to decide if he actually did it. Mm-hmm. They need to decide first if he did it as an official act. Yes. And they can decide yeah. that. Yeah. It's ambiguous, mm-hmm. you know, w- whether or not that was. So one of the uh, basically one of the examples that he used uh, in terms of in terms of you know how how evidence is going to work here is um imagine somebody was bribed like a president was bribed by a potential ambassador who wanted to be an ambassador and the president then appointed that person to become an ambassador and they became an ambassador you could prosecute them for bribery but you could not mention the fact that the person was given the ambassadorial ship like the mm-hmm. the ambassador position yeah so there's no pro of the quid 
Yeah, like you, you, you would not be allowed to say to mention that part, which, mm. oh my god, yeah, like that. That's that's the one part that uh, Amy Coney Barrett actually did descend on. Yeah, descent on. Yeah, I mean, I'm still stuck on this Justice Department thing, dude. Like the so since like the Nixon era, the White House officials generally like have a firewall between them and the prosecutions and investigations in the justice department because the executive the president should not be able to say like again we have a republic rule of law no one's above the law like the executive should not be able to tell the justice department who and what cases to investigate and prosecute but like Implied in this decision and discussed explicitly in the Roberts opinion is a significant change in breakdown of that, that really important norm. Uh, so this was specifically in talking about Trump's efforts in the 2020 election to get the Justice Department to investigate and promote the false claims of large scale voter fraud uh, and tampering. And in the majority, they wrote that uh, that that would be improper but that they could not, quote, divest the president of exclusive authority over the investigative and prosecutorial functions of the Justice Department and its officials. Uh, it said the president, quote, may discuss potential investigations and pro prosecutions with his attorney general and Justice Department officials. So basically, like, they're saying, like, not only is this definitely an official act to, like, pressure the Justice Department to 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 look into this thing, but also, like... As a president, you can just get in there and tell them what to investigate and what not to. Like, just tell them to, like, I don't know, prosecute Hunter Biden if you wanted or prosecute Joe Biden. Like, this is exactly kind of the the chilling effect on action that, like, they're trying to avoid. And they're getting it totally backwards because, like, they're just obsessed with trying to get Trump off. Yeah. Yeah. It's It's completely... It, yeah. It's it's completely anti-Republican. And yeah. when I say Republican, I don't mean like the party. I mean the, you know, the system of government. It is, yeah. it flies in the face of the rule of law. Um, they're, they're saying that the president of the United States can basically do whatever the fuck he wants as long as he does it under the guise of an official act. Yeah. And the argument that they would that the argument that they would make is well you know if he if he violates the law then there is a mechanism of consequences and that's impeachment, but that's never going to happen. Yeah. Because in order to be impeached, you have to have two thirds of the Senate mm -hmm. or to, to, to be removed rather. You have to have two thirds of the Senate agree to do that, mm -hmm. and you are not going to find enough Republicans. There will like if ever there was a time that Republicans would have been willing to 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 impeach and remove Trump it would have been it would have been impeaching him and removing him for that time that he sent a violent mob of people hmm. to kill them yeah but they still didn't do it yeah they still refused to do it yeah it's not going to happen which basically just means he has full authority yeah and, and and effectively what this is going to come what this is going to cause what this is going to lead to this means that the trial is definitely not going to happen mm -hmm. before the election it means that there are significant pieces of evidence that uh that the special counsel will not be able to use yeah it means that if trump does win he can basically tell the justice department hey you're going to drop this or he can just pardon himself mm -hmm. um it's it's just a fly in the face in, over the rule of law. But here's the other thing about that. Here, This is the thing that, that drives me crazy. Rule of law is what gives the Supreme Court its authority in the first place. Mm -hmm. If you rule that the rule of law no longer means anything, that we don't live in a republic, which is what you just fucking ruled, then that means that you, have no, you no longer have any power. And you know yeah. what? Biden should take advantage of that. Hmm. Biden should fucking take advantage of that. He should... You know that uh, you know that student loan program that the Supreme Court struck down. He should just do it. He should just Might do as it. Well, you know, official act. He's it's an official act. He's breaking the law. Who cares? He has immunity. 
Do you think the Democrats are going to remove him from office for that? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So just do it. All right. Just just do it. You know, totally. Um, He can write any any law he wants. Chevron deference. Just ignore the ruling. Just keep doing it. You know, why would you why would you care? You have immunity. We don't live in a republic. So just do it. All right. You know? Yeah. Serious. I mean, honestly, it could extend to all kinds of things. Yeah. Just every yeah. area that he convinced someone to do something. Like, and he's the president, you know? Like, oh, uh, power of the purse. Uh, I guess that re- resides in Congress. But, you know, like uh, federal funding, I, I'm sure Biden can influence some people. They'll just implement the the border law that he that didn't get passed through Congress anyway. Might as well. Yeah. Just write it down in executive action and give them a bunch of money. Uh, yeah, yeah, that'll work. No, that's the thing. Like these sound, these sound crazy, but these are like almost verging on silly examples in her descent. Sonia, justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote when he uses his official powers in any way under the majority's reasoning, he will now be insulated from criminal prosecution orders. The Na- the Navy's seals six team seal team six to assassinate a political rival immune. Organizes a military coup to hold on to power. Immune. Takes a bribe in exchange for a pardon. Immune. Immune, immune, immune. And then she later wrote, of course, for with fear for our democracy, I dissent. So basically, like, I, I think, like, that is not overblowing it. No, not at all. It is official power to be able to deploy, like, the military. Or certainly it's been an accepted one. Like... He could certainly do any of those things. And that's the thing. I'm mad about this thing, this ruling with respect to how it affects the Trump trial. I think this is a clear intervention intervention on behalf of Trump. But what this does to our ability to have a government with checks and balances, to have a limited executive, to have the Supreme Court be able to in, like enforce its its rulings because like the the executive is bound by them basically that the executive is bound by the courts like all of those things are now totally up in the air and totally at risk it's absolutely insane and totally destructive and now it's time for one of our favorite segments asshat Ass of, of, of the week so nathan who is our asshat this week well michael we have a newcomer we have oh. a newcomer for uh, for our asshats. Um, this is somebody that I don't even know if we've talked about this guy ever. Like he's mm, a, he's a prominent figure, right. yeah. But like he's a prominent figure in theory, but I've just kind of never given a shit about him. So I don't know. Uh, it is uh, CNN commentator Van Jones. Oh wow, Van Jones! Surprised to see him on the show. Yeah, Vanny Joe, come on down. All right. So, what did Van Jones do to get on our show? Well, we haven't talked about uh, Palestine in a few weeks. Hmm. Mostly because we have we put didn't put out an episode for half that time. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, there's still a genocide going on. Oh. There are still uh, countless people being killed and maimed and uh children being murdered and it's so i guess no news is bad news then yeah no news is very much very much bad news um so there was a protest at this los angeles synagogue that um that was held in response to the fact that uh the the, the synagogue was apparently holding an event where they were promoting the sale of real estate in occupied Palestinian land, oh, which wow. is, you know, what, like when I, when I first like when I first saw like there was a protest at a synagogue, I was thinking, oh, is this is this going to be something that's anti-Semitic? And it's like, oh, oh, they're they're literally trying to give away other people's land. Okay, no, n- never mind. Yep, yeah, protest away. Racistly, um, <laughs> racistly, yeah. yeah. So Van Jones responded by saying, "quote The Jewish neighborhoods in L.A. are well known." Nobody is confused where they are. So if you show up there wearing a keffiyeh, you show up there with your face covered, you show up there chanting river to the sea, that would be just like a white person running up with a Confederate flag in Harlem. You're not trying to start a conversation. You're trying to start a fight. Stop doing that. Don't do that. He's comparing a keffiyeh, which is 
like a ceremony, a, 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 a traditional garb worn by Palestinians to the Confederate flag. Jesus fucking Christ. To the That's, Confederate um, flag. Like, okay, when I watched that clip, I actually didn't know that the, 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 the coverage of it just referred to it as real estate, <laughs> not real estate owned by Palestinians in occupied Palestine. Uh, and so I was like, you know what? A lot of this, Van Jones, you know, you're saying a lot of good stuff. He was talking about how you shouldn't protest people. You should protest policies. You shouldn't show it at a synagogue. You should show up at City Hall. Like, I was like, okay, I can get behind that. And then he wills, whips that, and I was like, damn it, you ruined it. But then I, then you're like, point about the fact that this is uh, uh, trying to promote the sale of land that was stolen. Yeah. Um, at least most recently, that's pretty fucked up. And then on top, and, and then of course, that's the least fucked up part by the time you get to the end of the clip, which is so crazy. Like, just turn it on its head. Yeah. Like, uh, Jewish protesters protest outside of a mosque wearing yarmulkes. Yeah. No one, like, that would be, like, to yeah. say that yarmulkes were similar to the Confederate flag would be, like, insane. Yeah. He would be so upset. That that would never even occur to Van Jones. But yeah. because it's a Palestinian garb, because it is, you know, something that he's not as familiar with and he's not aligned with the group that he's trying to advocate on behalf of, like, it's the Confederate flag. Yeah. Fuck off. That's so <laughs> fucked. Like, yeah. It's so fucked. <laughs> I mean God, this just it's, like yeah. This is this is this is the state of conversation in the mainstream media regarding yeah. the indiscriminate bombing of of children and the stealing of of land. Mm -hmm. Like not only are you wrong not not only are the people that are stealing the land right, but you're wrong to protest it. And not only mm -hmm. are you wrong to protest it, you're racist to protest it. And not yeah. only you are you racist to protest it, you're racist to wear to dress like yourself to, while to you protest. dress like yourself while you protest it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Oh and not God. only are you racist to dress like yourself while you protest, but it is as bad and as racist as a war fought to preserve the institution of slavery in the United States. Yeah. Yeah, that, you might that is still might represented well... <laughs> by flags flown today. Yeah, you might as well be you might as well be saying like it's okay to own people. Yeah. That's like it's just so stupid. What a fucking nimrod of a take. <laughs> so a deep and hearty congratulations to Van Jones for being this week's Ass Hat, Ass -hat of, the, of week. the Week. And now we'll end our show as we usually do with our highlights. So Nathan, what's your highlight this week? My highlight this week is that it has been a lot cooler outside, mm. which means I've been able to uh, take my daughter uh, on uh, carriage rides in the park. Nice. Like I've been, I've been taking, I've been doing these uh, almost daily walks where I'll I'll go all the way to our local park and do a lap and sit on the bench near the pond and look at all the fishies mm. and you know hold Sylvia up so she can see them too, and you know she. She just has the these these wide eyes looking all over at them, <laughs> and she sometimes reaches her hands out as if she's gonna grab them. And there's ducks and swans, and those fascinate her too. And it's just so cute, and it's just been wonderful father and daughter time that I've only been able to do because the last two days uh, have not been the you know the surface of the sun. Yeah, that is awesome. That sounds great, dude. Glad yeah. to hear it. Yeah. What about you, Michael? What's what's your highlight? Hmm. I think my highlight this week is that so for a while I've been working on this project where um I'm I'm calling it my uh I've been working on a setup to like work from anywhere, basically, which means like I want to be able to literally drive out into the middle of nowhere and be able to comfortably and effectively do my job so that Bree and I can go and camp and hike and do all this stuff way out in nature and not have to you know, worry about work. So as you might imagine, that's a fairly significant endeavor. You got to figure out a lot of stuff, but we're finally at like the last stage. We just got a rooftop tent for our car, which means that we'll literally have a mattress that we can sleep on. 
um, out there in, in the beautiful wilderness. So, um, yeah, so that just arrived, which basically means that we're going to give it a first test run this week. Um, we're going to drive out into the mountains, <clears throat> and then I'll work Friday between the holiday on, on the 4th and the weekend from the middle of nowhere. So that's pretty exciting. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Have fun. Should be good. All right. And now we'll thank the incredible people that make this show possible. So thank you, our amazing patrons. Thank you to Taylor Bloom, Jerry DeVilla, Fade Out Scoop, Kyle Chaska, and Tobias Janssen for contributing to make the show possible. And thank you to our editor, Kayla, for all they do to produce this show. And thank you, dear listener, for listening to The Perspectrum. And you'll hear from us again next week. Thank you.